All right, so we are about to begin our study of statistics. Now, before we begin, actually begin the study, let's talk about the word statistics. What does it mean? So you're, you're taking a statistics class. Do you know what statistics actually is? Well, my definition of statistics is the collection, organization, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. Now, according to this definition, if you've taken a class before in any subject, you've done statistics. I mean, think about what you do as a student. You go to class. You collect data. You collect information. You take notes. You listen to lecture. You read the textbooks. You study. You organize that data. Maybe you organize it in a notebook. You analyze and interpret that data when you're studying and learning from it. And finally, you present that data back. You take a test or a quiz or submit a homework assignment or a project or a presentation. So this definition really applies to any subject, not just math, not just statistics. All right. So now that that's out of the way, uh, in this slideshow, I want to talk about these first two, the collection and the organization of data. We're going to talk about types of data and ways to collect data before we talk about doing anything with the actual data. All right, so statistics, it's everywhere. Numerical inf information is everywhere. We're, we're inundated with it. And an understanding of statistics allows us to make intelligent decisions, and it allows us to not be influenced or, or swayed by things like advertisement and and... Uh, just numbers that are thrown at us, politics, if you watch the news. So you, my like, one of my main goals here is to convince you to question any numerical or statistical data or statements that you're exposed to. Yeah. So uh, if you cannot distinguish good from faulty reasoning or an understanding of data, you're vulnerable to manipulation. And this is important. You're vulnerable to manipulation. And a lot of times statistics is applied in such a way as it's meant to convince someone or some group of people of something, whether it's convince you to buy this product as opposed to a different product or vote for this person as opposed to another person. There's usually a, a, a goal in mind. That goal is usually some type of influence and statistics, an understanding of statistics. And it allows you to react intelligently when you're exposed to this type of information. Now, there's a lot of statistical statements. I mean, there's, there's, there's no, no limit to the examples of statistical statements out there. Four out of five dentists recommend dentine. Uh, almost 85% of lung cancers in men and 45% in women are tobacco related. So this is a list of, of statistical or statements that are statistical in nature. And when I read these, a lot of questions come to mind. And so, for example, four out of five dentists recommend dentine. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe that's true. Maybe not. The questions that I have were, who collected this data? Was it an employee of the dentine company? Who did they survey? Did they survey only dentists that chew gum? And they said, maybe... If you chew gum, what type do you recommend? If not, you're not part of our study. Uh, do they survey uh, different uh, ages? So young dentists, old dentists, you know, dentists who started practicing before all of these like good for your teeth type gums came out. Maybe they're a little less likely to recommend chewing any gum. So there's a lot of questions that you could ask for any statistical statement that you are exposed to. All right, so these claims that on the previous slide, all statistical in nature, uh, the, one, the one thing that you could see though is that they 
these have applied to so many different aspects of life, not just academically, but financially, politically, and just all different aspects of life. There's always something statistical that can be said or applied. And like I said, to be an intelligent consumer of information or statistics, your first reflex must be to question. Question the statistics that you encounter. The British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli famously said there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Now, in this, this in the area of statistics, there is a very sort of fine line between lying which uh, for example in the in, in in the context of let's say advertising lying is illegal a company gets sued or fined for lying but manipulating that's maybe unethical but can be done without breaking any laws all right so in so let's talk about the, the topic of statistics in general there's basically three three main topics that we that we discuss we talk about when we're studying statistics and that's descriptive statistics probability and inferential statistics so basically descriptive statistics deals with the past probability theory deals with the present and inferential statistics deals with the future so we're basically using information about things that have already happened to predict things that haven't happened yet. Now, for example, let's say you own a small business and you want to hire some extra help for the holiday season in December. Well, how many extra workers do you hire? Well, it shouldn't be a random decision, right? And if you hire too many people, you're wasting money. If you hire too few people, your customers will be unsatisfied and maybe not come back and you're losing money. So you want to make that decision intelligently and based on data, previous years, how the economy is doing, shopping habits, um, things like this. So an overview of statistics. And so in this, in, in this class, we'll be talking about descriptive statistics first for the first three or so chapters, then we'll switch over to probability for a few chapters, and then we'll move into inferential statistics. Okay, so for the next, uh, the next dozen or so slides, we're going to be talking about classification of data. So the first classification is population versus sample. The population of some study or some analysis is the entire group that is meant to be characterized. Now, sometimes that population is thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, in which case it's not logistically possible to ask every single person the same question. So what we do is we start with a population, population, and from that population, we take a sample and we study the sample because it's smaller and it's logistically easier to work with. And then based on what we see in the sample, we make some generalizations or characterizations about the population. When you do, and this is very, very rare, but when you do collect data from every single member of a population, we call that a census. A census is asking every single person or collecting data from every single object, whatever those objects may be. From a population, we call that a census. But when we work with just a sample, and this is what's mainly done almost always in statistics, we call that a survey. So basically, we take a we identify a population we want to study. Within that population, we choose a sample, and we'll talk later in this uh, slideshow about how to choose that sample. But we have a large population we want to study, so we choose a sample to work with. 
and when we collect data from that sample, that is called a survey. Now, coming from a population, a characterization of a population is called a parameter. Like, for example, the average height of an adult that identifies as male living in the U.S. is approximately 5 foot 9 inches. So that's a parameter. Now, no one measured the height of every single adult male in the U.S. That's not possible. So what we normally do is we work with a sample and we calculate values coming from that sample. And those are called statistics. So what we usually do is we calculate the exact value of statistics coming from samples and we use those we use those to estimate the value of parameters so usually we know the exact value of a statistic but only an estimation of a parameter all right, so uh, this first classification of data, so let me go back one slide, population versus sample, and the, within that topic of populations, a census is collecting information from a population, and a parameter is a characteristic of a population. So we choose a population, we select a sample, collect data from that sample, calculate sample statistics. When, when we use the word calculate, that means exact values. And we use them to then estimate the value of population parameters. So when we do that, when we collect a single sample and we calculate a statistic from that sample, those statistics correspond to a single sample of data, those are called point estimates. So a point estimate is used to estimate the value of a parameter. Now, how could you increase the accuracy of a point estimate? Well, there's a couple of ways. Most notably, though, we can collect more sample data. The more data we have, the better our estimates are of the population parameters. Now, a couple of drawbacks with point estimates, and we'll, we'll uh, later on in the semester, we're going to talk about estimation from a, from a more sort of um, inferential standpoint. Um, but in the beginning, when we're just talking about sample statistics, which are point estimates, well, there's a couple of drawbacks. How accurate is a point estimate? Well, so let's say I wanted to, I wanted to find the average number of parking tickets one of my students gets per year. So I ask a class, maybe 25 students, and I ask each person the same question. How many parking tickets did you get in the last year? And I get an average of 3.2. Now, what if I ask another class the same question, average it out, and I get 3.6? Which is the better estimate, 3.2 or 3.6? Well, the problem is we don't know. We can't know how accurate a point estimate is, and we can't compare the accuracy of two point estimates. It's a good starting point. It has value. It just can't be the end all of your analysis. Point estimates are a good starting point of a statistical estimation of a parameter. All right, so for example, a researcher wants to know how citizens of Tacoma, city in Washington, felt about a voter initiative. To study this, she goes to the Tacoma Mall and randomly selects 500 shoppers to ask them their opinion. 60% indicate they are in support of the initiative. So basically, you're asking a yes, no question. 500 people, do you support this, yes or no? And so this is saying 60% say yes. They support the initiative. Now, what is the sample and what is the population? 
Well, it's sometimes not as clear as it may initially seem. So it looks like the sample is those 500 shoppers that were asked a question. They, we have specific responses from those specific 500 people. All right. Now, what's the population? Well, is it everyone living in Tacoma? Uh, I, I don't think so. Because this question doesn't apply to anyone who is either not a registered voter or who is under the age of 18. So in this case, the population is only the voters, only the registered voters in the city of Tacoma. And since that 60% applies to a sample of 500 people, that 60% is a statistic. All right, similar question. To determine the average length of trout in a lake, researchers catch 20 fish and measure them. What is the sample and what is the population? The sample is usually a little bit more obvious. In this case, the sample is the 20 fish. 20 fish were caught and measured. Data was collected from those 20 fish. So that's our sample. Oh, what is the population? Well, again, since all the fish were caught in one specific lake, we can't make a generalization about all trout. We could only make a generalization about the trout living in the one specific lake where our sample was pulled from. All right, so that's, that's populations versus samples. Classification number two in terms of types of data. Quantitative versus qualitative data. Qualitative data is sometimes called categorical data. Quantitative versus qualitative. Quantitative data are responses that are numerical in nature, are numbers, but not just numbers. They are specifically numbers with which we could perform calculations. We could add, subtract, multiply, divide. Just because it's a number, doesn't mean it's quantitative data. We have to be able to do calculations on those numbers. Qualitative or categorical data are pieces of information that allow us to classify objects into groups. All right, so this is a very important distinction. Later on in the semester, we're going to have one whole chapter on quantitative data and one whole chapter on qualitative data, if we get that far. So, for example, we conduct a survey of students in a math class about the last movie each of them have seen. Three questions. So each person, I ask three questions. Question number one, what type of movie was it? Drama, comedy, action, romance, etc. Now, is the movie type, what type of movie, is that qualitative or quantitative? Uh, second, rate the movie on a scale of 1 to 10. Where 1 is terrible and 10 is the best movie ever. And question 3, how many days has it been since you've watched? Well, number 1. It looks like that's qualitative. That's categorical. So these are different categories of data. Drama, comedy. Uh, number two, rate the movie on a scale of one to ten. Well, uh, this one's not as clear. It turns out that a rating scale is not quantitative. Even though it's a numerical scale, it's qualitative. It's categorical. Because you could, you could replace those numbers with words, with adjectives. One, terrible. Two, below average. Three, pretty good. Four, not bad. Five, good. Six, really good. So, since those, those numbers are just sort of equivalent to feelings or, or adjectives, that is not quantitative data. But number three, number of days. Well, that's definitely, that's definitely quantitative. 
If it's been five days for me and seven days for you, well, seven minus five is two, so you've, you, it's been two days longer for you than it has been for me since I've seen a movie. All right, so qualitative, qualitative, quantitative. It's not always entirely clear. Is uh, another example. Zip codes. I ask a group of people, what is the zip code where you live? Is this qualitative or quantitative? Remember, quantitative data has to be numbers, but more specifically, numbers that you can apply mathematical operations to. If you can't apply mathematical operations, it is not quantitative data. So even though zip codes are made up of numbers, we can't add two zip codes or subtract or divide two zip codes and get anything meaningful. Even though 98,036 is two times 49,018 with a zip code 49018 and the zip code 98036 are not related in the same two to one ratio. So zip codes are definitely categorical data. Again, you could replace a zip code with the name of the town. Uh, we've talked about this, rating scale. Numbers can be replaced with words. So this is definitely qualitative, definitely categorical data. All right. A rating of four is not does not mean the movie is exactly twice as good as a movie has a rating of two. All right, so now to get a little bit more specific, we have our quantitative data and our qualitative data. Our qualitative, also called categorical. There are levels of measurement within, so more specific levels of measurement within these two classifications. So these four levels of measurement, the first two are qualitative or categorical, and the next two are quantitative. So let's go through these one at a time. Level one, nominal data. This is the lowest level of data. It's categorical and there's no order to it. Now, you know what, let me take a step back and I wanna, I wanna sort of focus on this word right here, data. A lot of times people sort of equate the word data with numbers. Data does not mean numbers. Numbers are a type of data, but there's other types of data. Data, the word data just means information. So if I asked 25 people, what is your eye color? That's data. That's information collected, that is data. It's definitely not numerical. It's definitely not, uh, we definitely can't apply mathematical operations to eye color, brown, blue, green, hazel, and so on. And it's categorical with no inherent order. That's what makes it nominal. No inherent order. Blue doesn't come before brown. Brown doesn't come before green. Their colors, their categories, but they're, they're, they don't have a specific order that they have to fall in. Now, if we take level one, nominal data, and we add to it order, we get level two, ordinal data. So these are categories that do have a specific order. For example, final grades. Those aren't numbers, those are letters. But they have an order. A comes before B, B comes before C, and so on. So categories that do have inherent order, those are at the ordinal level of measurement. Level three is the interval level. So now we're dealing with quantitative data. So ordinal data that is quantitative or numerical data where addition and subtraction makes sense. 
but multiplication and division do not. Now that's not very straightforward. So we're going to have to sort of dive a little bit deeper into that sort of classification, uh, which we'll do in a couple of slides. So if we take level three, the interval level of data, and we include multiplication and division, we get level four, which is the ratio level. So we have nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. The first two are quantitative. The second, or this stuff, sorry. The first two are qualitative or categorical. And levels three and four are quantitative. Now, the, what makes a distinction between interval and ratio? So, like, the distinction up here between nominal and ordinal, that's a lot more clear. Either it has order or it doesn't. With the intervals or ratio levels, that's not usually as clear. And I think the, the, the best way to make the distinction is this. Ratio data has a smallest number or a first number starting point. So quantitative data with no starting point is interval. Quantitative data with a starting point is ratio. So for example, temperature is not at the ratio level because multiplication doesn't make sense. So for example, 80 degrees and 40 degrees. Well, 80 degrees is not twice as hot as 40 degrees. Absolutely not. Even though 2 times 40 equals 80, but 80 degrees and 40 degrees are not at a two to one ratio, or 80 is not, 80 degrees is not two times 40 degrees. And you could see that. You could see that easily by converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. So in Fahrenheit, you have 80 and 40, and 80 is twice 40. But when you convert to Celsius, 80 degrees Fahrenheit becomes 27 degrees Celsius. 40 degrees Fahrenheit becomes 4 degrees Celsius, and 27 is not 2 times 4. But 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius, they mean the same thing. Height, on the other hand, is at the ratio level. Because 80 inches is twice as tall as 40 inches. And also, height has a smallest number. There is nothing below zero. A height of zero is as small as it gets. You cannot have a negative height. A level of measurement is important, you know, not so much, and I, you know, take this with a grain of salt, not so much for this class. Now, level of measurement, and there's going to be some topics that we're going to use for four or five or six different chapters. Level of measurement, it exists here in chapter one. We'll see it in chapter one, and we're not going to see it again for the rest of this course. So just keep that in mind. There's going to be, and I'll try to point out the topics that are of the most importance in terms of things we're going to be using over and over again. All right. So summary, we have nominal level one, ordinal level two, interval level three, ratio level four, nominal and ordinal are qualitative, interval and ratio, quantitative. Okay, another classification of data, discrete versus continuous. Now again, this is, this is going to be important moving forward in our study of statistics. Later chapters, we're definitely going to be talking about discrete data. We deal with that one way. And continuous data, we deal with that another way. Discrete data arrives, arises from a counting process. Continuous data you cannot count. You can only measure. So, for example, number of chairs in a room. 
So basically, the way I make the distinction between these two, discrete and continuous, is discrete data has a next number. You pick, if your data is discrete, you pick one number at random, there is a well-defined next number. So for example, number of chairs. After 16 chairs, has to come 17. After 37 chairs, has to come 38. But when we think about liquid, amount of Pepsi in a bottle, well, what's the next amount of liquid after 16 ounces? Well, it's not 17 ounces. So what about 16 and a half? It's not 16 and a half. What about 16.1? Not 16.1. What about 16.01 or 16.001? So with, with amount of liquid, that is an example of continuous data. It can only be measured. You cannot count a liquid. All right. So we've talked about populations versus samples. And within that, parameters versus statistics. We've talked about census versus a survey. We've talked about quantitative data versus qualitative and the levels of measurement. We've talked about discrete data versus continuous data. So that sort of does it for our classifications or types of data. So what I want to talk about now is collecting sample data. Now, sometimes, and actually, usually, the person asking the questions can have an effect on the answers they received. And this could be due to many factors. I think the, the key word here is anonymous. If I were to ask you a question, um, let's say I asked you the question, uh, how many times since entering college have you cheated or copied or plagiarized? I ask you that question. Now, if I asked you to write it down on a piece of paper with your name, first and last name and your student ID number, and then give me your response and hand me that piece of paper versus write it down on a piece of paper, fold it up and put it in a box somewhere and I'll never know who wrote what or even type it up so I can't do any handwriting analysis. So the fact that I, in one case, know who is responding, know, know what responses go to what person, in the other case it's anonymous, I guarantee you people will be more likely to answer honestly if the question is asked anonymously. So, in a real-world situation, usually we get more accurate results when surveys are done anonymously. So, for example, consider the next uh, four-question survey. Do you smoke marijuana? Have you ever cheated or been unfaithful? Have you ever stolen something? How many times in your life have you ever been abusive or cruel to an animal? So think about this, these four questions. Would you give the exact same four answers if you had to put your name on your responses versus if your responses were anonymous? Possibly, maybe, but in many, many cases, your answers would be different. Especially if this is a survey I gave you on the first first day of class and I said, fill it out, answer it, put your name on it and post it for the class to see, you're probably potentially, not saying definitely, but you're potentially more likely to lie. Maybe a, a yes becomes a no because you don't want anyone to know that the answer is yes. All right. So that's one big, big source of bias in the process of collecting sample data. And um, it, it usually comes down to, uh, often it comes down to the person responding to the survey being embarrassed of their answer. For example, do you know who this is? This is Jesse the Body Ventura. 
professional wrestler, action movie star from the 80s and 90s. He was elected to run the state of Minnesota. He was elected to be the governor of Minnesota. And just and this was back in the late 90s and just like what happened much more recently with Donald Trump up until the day of the election all of the polls were saying he was going to lose. Same thing with Donald Trump. The polls were saying he was going to lose. And the reason why is that when people were, were polled. The word poll is just another word for survey specifically used for politics. So you're collecting data from a sample. And if someone was asked, who are you going to vote for? Or are you going to vote for Jesse Ventura? Maybe... You know, I don't know, maybe they're a little embarrassed to say, yes, I'm going to vote for that guy. So they say no, even though later they do go and vote for him. So it throws off or it, it creates a bias in the results. So we call that sampling bias. Sampling is the process of collecting data. And sampling bias is the phenomenon in which your results are affected by the feelings or the opinions of the people giving the answers. So there's a lot of reasons. It could, it could not, it could be other reasons and embarrassment. That's just a big one. Um, maybe the fact that he was running on a third party ticket and people like an underdog, maybe that affected the fact that he won, which contradicted the statistical polls. Uh, maybe respondents were embarrassed to say they were actually going to vote for him. Or maybe the polls showed he had little chance of winning. Maybe that prompted people to vote for him. Who knows? There could be other reasons. But these are all examples of sampling bias. So when we collect data, our goal, our goal is to eliminate or at least diminish as much as possible the amount of sampling bias. And this comes into how we design our experiment. All right, so if we go back to the very first slide, the definition of statistics, the collection, organization, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data, well, that first step is collection of data. There's a lot of different ways you could collect data. There's certain ways that have... Uh, uh, strong or significantly high levels of sampling bias, and there are other methods that all but eliminate it. So your goal should be to minimize sampling bias as much as possible. Now the sampling method, and we'll talk about sampling methods in the next slideshow, but the sampling method is biased so that's the design of the experiment. A sampling method is biased if every member of the population doesn't have an equal likelihood of being in the sample. So let's say, for example, I wanted to survey citizens of Boston. And going back to parking tickets, I want to know how many parking tickets on average do you get each year? And since I don't have a car, I take the T. So I take the T, I take the subway, if you're not familiar with Boston, I take the train, I get off at a train station or at a T stop, I stand outside the station, and I ask 100 people, how many tickets have you gotten in the past year? Then I go to an, uh, take a train to another station, stand outside that station, ask another 100 people, how many parking tickets have you gotten in the last year? Well, that is a biased method of sampling, because... The people who take the subway are more likely to not have a car, so they're less likely to get a ticket, but they're more likely to be part of my study because I'm only asking people right outside the train station. So people who drive every day or drive into the city, they're not likely to be right outside of a train station, so they're less likely to be part of my study. Ergo, that sampling method is considered biased. So we want to we want to uh, sort of eliminate that sampling bias as much as possible. 
And there's a number of ways we do this. And we'll talk about a number of different ways. Um, voluntary responses, people responding to surveys, they often have a larger degree of sampling bias. So we'll talk about experiments versus observational studies and a couple of other things uh, later on. All right. So that about does it for this slideshow. Uh, in the next one, I want to um, continue on talking about methods of sampling, different ways of selecting. So remember, we talked about uh, you want to make some generalization about a population. So from that population, you choose a sample. So I want to talk about different ways of picking that sample, different methods for picking that sample that reduce sampling bias. That will be the topic of the next video.